Hey everyone, welcome to Mind Pump. In this episode, they talk about fat phobia and other lies that may be keeping you fat, sick, and unhealthy. You are eating more than you are moving, and you want to justify that. Mm -hmm. It is literally that simple. It is a justification for your behaviors. Stop it. Get some help. This is a controversial episode, made me a bit squeamish at times, but they speak the truth. If you want short clips from this show, go to Mind Pump Clips right here on YouTube and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. There's a new enemy in the fitness space, and it's victimhood. You got to shed the victim mentality or you will not succeed. Today's episode, we're going to talk about all the different ways that try to manipulate you into making you feel like a victim so that you stay fat, sick, unhealthy, and sad. If watching Sal getting canceled on Instagram wasn't enough for you, buckle up. <laughs> I'm annoyed. There's more. Hell, you know, there's this movement, and it started. It, it, at first, it was kind of like small. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I talked about it a little bit on the show, maybe a year or two ago. I think we did an episode called Woke Fitness about Woke Fitness, where we kind of pointed it out. But it was small enough to where people. I even got messages from people being like, "That's not really happening. Yeah. I don't see that." Yeah, I thought it was parody uh, when you sent it over before. I was like, "This has to be from the Onion or one of those kind of uh, publications." No, I can see now. It's starting to grow to the point where it's starting to gain attention from from all people, from people who believe it, people who are against it. And you know, I'm not going to look. I'm going to be quite honest. The fitness and health wellness space has always been filled with bullshit, right? It's always had a lot of bad information. That's why we started this podcast. But this type of information is the worst. It's the worst because it's insidious. It preys on people's empathy and it prevents people from even taking that first step. So the other lies make people do the wrong thing, work out too hard, try fad diets, all bad, all bad. We've crushed all those. But this is different. It's more insidious and it's going to actually demonize everything that's right about the fitness space through telling outright lies and making people feel good about feeling bad, which is not a good thing. Now, how, how conspiratorial do you guys get in this when you when you see this happening right now? Like, I mean, because here's you're, you're trying not to, but you know, I think it's it's one of those things. You just what's the um like what's the motivation, right? And like, and to me, it's just it's it's some kind of like to include politics in so much of our lives these days. I think it's advantageous now to really kind of move people one side or the other. Uh, you know, in, in any kind of regard, it's like they're going to get votes because they're polarizing people so much. You know, I I know I give you guys a hard time about that stuff, and um, I normally just like let it roll like the whole like politics got into my football they got into my basketball i was sour about it for a little bit felt better about it after about a year or two and i felt like it got a little bit better at least um but now they're coming after fitness man and like now now i feel yeah. a little more irritated than i did yeah. before because right it's our it's already been i feel like our whole career kind of an uphill battle to 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 make people feel <laughs> comfortable to take that first big step of taking action it's hard enough yeah exactly and so if if now we have, and so then it makes you wonder, right? Like I, we know that the, the, uh, uh, in politics, it's ideal to divide us, right? Divide us so they can conquer and steer the narrative That's and right. so that. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, us being weak is also advantageous for. Oh, that okay. Too, so you're right? hitting you're hitting the nail right. on the head, in, in my opinion. So first off, what's the motivation? Well, it's always to make money. So that's always number one. So yeah. how can I sell people things? And, and making people feel uh, divided and victimized, especially when I provide a solution, is a great way to make money. So there's that. But then there's also what you said, Adam, which is people, when they don't feel empowered, are very easily manipulated. And fitness is a pursuit of self-empowerment. Anybody who's done it for a long time will tell you this. If you've done it for longer than five years, especially if you've done it for longer than 10 years, it's extremely empowering because it's a journey of failure and success. It's a journey of self-acceptance. It's a journey of, you know, accepting what you can control, what you can't control of hard work and effort and what you get in return. It's a journey of discipline. It's a journey of self-mastery, right? And somebody who has, who feels very empowered, right? Who feels very in control of themselves, who feels like they have self-mastery or at least they have the tools to accomplish a certain level of self-mastery. Well, it's it's going to be hard to manipulate me. It just is. If you're on a stage telling me how I need all these other things that you're going to offer me in order to feel good or comfortable or safe, or you're telling me all these other people are the reason why I have 
all these problems and I feel empowered, I'm going to look at you and be like, ah, that's not true. And no, I'm not going to, I don't like that message because I feel good about myself. I feel good about what I'm doing. And so it makes people very easily manipulated. And it's a fact, by the way, if think about it this way, are you, when you feel confident, happy, healthy, are you more or less likely to fall for scams? Are you more or less likely to believe that someone who has a differing opinion is evil versus just differing opinion? What kind of lens and filter do you see the world through when you're healthy, strong, and confident? And I mean, this is all, of course, within context. It's not me. You might not be stronger than that guy, but you yourself feel that particular way. Now let's do the flip. How do you feel when you're sick? I mean, when I have a cold, I'm I'm negative. Just right. the bottom, just the cold makes you're me just feel down. Yeah, your your overall energy, your thought process. You're kind of like I. You want to be in isolation a lot of times. You don't want to be around people. So that's just you know commonly. If I feel if I don't feel good, I'm not necessarily projecting my best self. Yes, and there's n there's not a single drug or combination of drugs or medical intervention that comes close to improving your your uh, to your health when it comes to your mental state. Things like depression, anxiety fears, confidence, they improve better through exercise, nutrition, um, through feeling empowered, through taking you know control of certain things. They improve better and they continue to improve long-term better than any other medical intervention we have. It, but here's the problem. It's all of it or most of it's free, right? So there's not like a product that I'm buying. There's not like a drug that I'm buying. So that's where I think the root is of this. And then politicians are smart because what they do is they find areas of the culture where they can demonize and they can control. And fitness is open now. It's prime. And they're, and they're showing now this might be a great place for them to, to permeate. So how much does your guys' head explode when, you know, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer come up with some breakthrough drug that, you know, stops fat gain or, or eviscerates yeah. fat better than any supplement on the market and it's patented by them? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, then the, and then the government comes out as encouraging everybody to take yeah. that instead. I mean, how, how, how much do you freak out when that happens? You know why? Let's just pretend, for example, this won't happen, but let's just pretend they did invent the perfect drug for that. Mm. Literally keeps you lean and there's zero side effects, which would never exist. But let's just say zero side effects. You just take a pill. You could eat whatever you want. Don't have to exercise and you're lean. Is that going to give you all the benefits of the journey through exercising, eating right, uh, creating a better relationship with exercise and nutrition, creating a better relationship with yourself, all the things that happen on the fitness journey. No. no you're not going to learn any of those disciplines. It's the difference between um, being flown to the top of a mountain versus climbing it. Yeah, you still get the same view, I guess, but is it really the same experience? Do you really no. become the same person? No. So when that drug comes out, which I think at some point it will, although I think there'll be side effects, I think there'll be all kinds of other stuff, um, I, I'm, I'll be happy because people will take it. It'll take a while, but people will take it and then be like, why am I not feeling all the benefits that I've always heard about being fit and healthy? Like what's going on? And then we'll be able to be like, well, here's why. Oh, I wonder if that's what you'll get from it. If it is, it, it, to me, that's a long curve. That's going to take a long curve. Yeah. It's going to be, I don't know. I almost feel like it'd step us back 15, 20 years. At first. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's part of me is like, it just feels like a natural progression of uh, over decades of us trying to solve anything that's hard, right? Like if, uh, like if I can get to point A to point B faster, more efficiently, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's sort of the trajectory that we're always trying to achieve with any kind of technology advancement, any kind of education. Like, how can I get there quicker? How can I retain all this, you know, faster? How can I get uh, what I used to work um, decades for in just a few Justin, weeks? Justin, that is the key right there. There is no point A and point B with fitness. There is no point. There is no point B. It's the getting to points along the way that you can arbitrarily create, but it's the journey. It's the right. process where you get all the value. And you talk to anybody, again, if you're watching or listening to this and you know somebody who's exercised and ate right, and it's really something that they prioritize for like 10 years or more, ask them and they'll tell you this. They'll tell you this 100%. So, so that's just it. What's it is that people think it's the end result where mm -hmm. they're going to get the value. There's a little value in that, right? You're healthier, I guess, physically and all that stuff. But it's not really most of the value at all. It's, it's everything along the way. All right, here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Starter. This is a great beginner program for somebody just getting started with strength training. Here's how you can win for free. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. 
turn on notifications, do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won free access to Map Starter. Also, we got a sale going on right now. Maps Symmetry, 50% off. Maps Strong, 50% off. If you're interested in getting that discount on those two very popular, great strength training programs, make sure you click on the link at the top of the description below to get set up. All right, here comes the show. Let's talk about some of these big lies that have been promote, promoted and pushed um, that are so dangerous to everything that we try to do. And by the way, for people who don't know, if you're new to, to, to this podcast, the three of us collectively have worked with and trained people and coached people and managed gyms. And essentially, we've been trying to help people solve this issue for themselves, the issue of uh, poor health, obesity, you know, poor mobility, pain, that kind of stuff for collectively over 60 years. So we've made a careers out of this and it's only recently we made good careers out of it. Right. For a long time, we worked hard <laughs> in an industry where it's hard to make a lot of money. So it wasn't money driven, it was definitely passion driven first. So so this is our, our, our big passion. But let's start with the first one. The first one is the message of um, health at any size or health at every size. Uh, now I get the, the core of it, which is you can be overweight and be healthier or be overweight and less healthy, okay? But the way that they're spinning it and using it is to say that the same person at a decent or should I say appropriate body weight or body fat percentage would have the same health than if they were 50 pounds or 100 pounds overweight. That's not true at all. It's, it's, it's false. The being obese by itself is a health risk factor, regardless of all the other things. So this is a terrible message. There's no such thing as being healthy and being obese. You'll be healthier, all things being considered at a you know, uh, more acceptable or appropriate body weight, I should say. I, I think a, a, a lot of the points that you you had written down, I think they they started off with good intentions. Mm -hmm. Like if you get on, there's a, uh, there's a, there, there's a website for the health at, um, health at every size. size. I forget what it's called, but you, they have like basically, a you know, their, their breakdown or their mission statement or whatever. And there's not a lot I disagree with at all yeah. reading that. In fact, I don't think I disagreed with anything when I read it. But it, what un, what's unfortunate, and I don't know how common this is, and you, this is more a political thing, I feel like, and you would know this, like, you know, how often does a movement get hijacked? Mm -hmm. Like somebody who is great Always. at ma man manipulating something sees an opportunity that, oh, wow, this is gaining traction. Mm -hmm. Let me adopt it early. I'm going to do, use this to do this. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I think a lot of- bastardize it. Yeah, when I, when I look at the things that you wrote down, um, I feel the same way that you do too. But then I also- feel like I can remove myself a little bit and go like, okay, at the, at the core of these, I think, or I want to believe they started with good intentions and then they've been hijacked. And I think, I think some of them started with the kernel of truth. Some of them are complete and utter lies, Yeah, but I think the health at every size, that specific one That's started, started with a kernel of truth, which is Yes, and I used to talk to, look, I worked with clients for a long time who struggled with being overweight. Some of them never got to their ideal body weight. Some of them struggled with it the entire time I trained them. However, their health still dramatically improved. So there's definitely truth that if you're overweight or obese, but you're exercising and you still made some changes into your nutrition, you still made some lifestyle change, just not enough to lose all the weight. Yeah. So you're still overweight. You're going to be healthier. Well, made, they, and I nothing. think, and I think too, it was sort of backlash to a lot of like the models they're portraying. Yeah, good idea. Um, back, you know, back in the day, you get all these like cover model fitness uh, people that were like super shredded, or like you know, girls that were like very thin and, and lean, and and that being the ideal body type they kept portraying. So it was like sort of a push back on that into because we've never really hit that happy medium of health, like what that really looks like is in terms of marketability. So they went to the other extreme of that to try and include a lot of people that didn't feel included. Uh, but yeah, You're right. I think it just got if, totally if, bastardized. If there was a picture of a pro bodybuilder on a magazine and it said, this is healthy, it would be just as preposterous, even though they're big and shredded, it would be just as preposterous as what I'm seeing where they have somebody who's clinically obese and they've already didn't, so there's now been several magazine covers or, you know, articles or whatever with this, where they have an obese individual and it says, this is healthy. It's just as preposterous. Both are very unhealthy. Well, I, both are extreme. I think the kernel of truth they stand on is, and, I, and I'm sure you guys can uh, think of a scenario where this has happened in your career. I mean, I definitely remember there's been times where I've had a client um, who is, you know, 40, 50 pounds overweight and she was healthier 
uh, than the little skinny model girl that I trained. Right. I mean, right. so, so those, there's, there's, there, there's examples. Well, of you that. just, you just brought up a good point, which is, um, when it comes to health, there's a lot of individual uh, factors being played yeah. and you're right. Comparing yourself to someone else, um, is not an appropriate comparison. You really can't, you don't know what's going on. Someone can even have perfect physical mm -hmm. body fat percentage, look good. Uh, but really be, have, be this in poor how, health because yeah. of mental issues and stuff like this that. This is how they defend that though. You right, know, so you know, because th there are examples of that. There is an example of a client I had who just yeah. like, carries 50 pounds overweight. She over consumes food on a regular basis, but she she trains hard and she trains athletic so she could run, right. she could jump, she could squat good weight and just- and Maybe she's got good relationships in life and yeah. she gets good sleep. Right, and but then you're right. But then the, she's still overweight by 50 pounds. But, you know, if I had to met the other girl that I was giving an example of was a, you know, aspiring supermodel girl who used to starve her body used to do cocaine used to do like and just a terrible race of food doing drugs and yet uh it, the average person would see those two people and go oh she's the skinny girl is You're probably right. so i get i get that argument but it it still is not a it's still not a good representation of what true health looks like. Cause then there's the other element of if you're carrying that much extra body fat on you, there is a part of you. That's not, you're, you're, you're not being honest with yourself. If you're saying that I'm the, the healthiest I could be, right. you know, are you in better shape than what you were when you were a hundred pounds overweight? Or are you in better shape than the coked out girl who's starving herself? Arguably? Yes. But I don't think that you are a, a true representation of, of health and positioning it that way, I think is, is a, a, right. a danger. And the reason why that's such a disingenuous um, comparison is you have to, you can only, to have an accurate comparison, you can only compare yourself to yourself. Because me versus someone else, first of mm -hmm. all, I can't judge them 100% on how they look. There's a few things you can look at and say, okay, well, that person may overeat, that person may undereat, whatever. But you, you can't really make a comparison. But what I can say is if you have the same person in two scenarios doing the same things, the only difference is one version of them is at a body weight, a body weight that's appropriate, and the other version of them is 50 pounds higher than that in body fat. The 50 pounds higher body fat is going to have worse health. So the reason why this is such a damaging and the way that they're twisting it and pushing it, the reason why it's so damaging is it's telling a bunch of people that obesity doesn't matter. Yeah. That obesity isn't a risk factor Which for health. It's just not honest. It's not honest. It's a big lie. And it's what it what's what's happening, what I'm seeing is this false um this false self-love movement from it. Oh, I love myself. Ah, that's why I eat this food. That's why I'm overweight. This is me loving my you know, you're not loving yourself. Right. You might feel good because well, you're not feeling bad about yourself, but you're not actively loving yourself. You're still making yourself. Let's unhealthy. just say that's step one. Right. Right. So yes, I do agree with the sentiment of loving yourself. And I think that if we get into fitness and health and we're, we're motivated to go on that journey. It should be motivated uh, on behalf of you loving yourself yeah. and improving yourself and wanting the best for yourself and yep. being the optimal version of yourself. And all that happens through the journey and the process of, um, you know, refining that through fitness and, and health uh, practices. But, you know, we can't just stopping there is, it, it, it's not being honest with yourself and it's really not loving yourself because you're, you're not really continually trying to, to address these things and to, and to love yourself by, by focusing on, you know, the work that goes into the That's right. action. Well, we, we, we talked about this in the relationship yeah, the conversation. Well, love's not a feeling. It's an action. You're not taking action on something that is that, that would be truly loving yourself, and and that would yeah. be taking care of your health, being healthier. So uh, yeah, no, I'm 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 not a fan, and I and I think that this has been exaggerated because uh, it's a, as a marketing ploy. Yes, you could sell people, man. When you when you sell them that they're this is why I get so annoyed. Is the very people that I've made a career out of helping, sincerely trying to help. Like I have a deep passion. It's, it's hard not to get emotional when I talk about it because. This is something I, d I care very deeply about. These same people are being manipulated so hard. And I get mad when they get manipulated in all kinds of different directions. The fitness and health space has done it so many different ways, you know, diet pills and crazy yeah. workouts and all that stuff. But boy, this is a this one is really bad because it it, it preys on their empathy. It makes them feel like victims. Mm -hmm. And then they and then they want to do nothing about what's going on. And because they've been lied to so poorly. It actually deters them from pursuing a lot of times, yes. uh, you know, fitness in general. Yes. The next one, here's the next one. This is a term, and this is what people love to do. This is what these 
these people like to do, uh, people that like to, you know, either, either political move, these, I guess, political propagandists or people who try to come up with terms to manipulate people is they invent terms. Fat phobia is one of those things. First of all, <laughs> a phobia. Can we can we get the definition of that? Yeah. Is, do, what is, is a it, phobia? Is, just look up what did, is a phobia. Did Webster. No, give me just give me fat phobia. Well, no, just example. look up phobia because phobia is like a clinical term. It's different. Like I don't like spiders, but do I have a clinical phobia against spiders? Right. No, right? Very different. Mm. So what they're doing is they're trying to say, well, people who are trying to get you to lose weight are fat phobic. <laughs> Okay. That's yeah. like saying a cancer doctor they, who's trying to get you to get rid of cancer is cancer phobic or a heart. Somebody's trying to help you, you get with heart diseases is heart, heart disease phobic. Did an actual sense. psychologist come up with this term? No. Because otherwise it's invalid. It is. Here it it's is. It's not a real word. An extreme or irrational fear or aversion to something. So if I'm trying to help someone lose weight, which means I'm actually trying to help them and work with them, do I have an extreme or irrational fear or aversion? That doesn't make me a phobic, yeah. you know, fat phobic. Yeah. But what they say is, oh, if you're not, if you try to get people to lose weight, you're fat phobic. Gyms are full of fat phobic people. If you're trying to lose weight yourself, you have your own fat phobia. This is so terrible because it's like it's it's um, pathologizing mm -hmm. the process of improving your health, your your health, which okay. is crazy. Read it, Sal. Read it. What's it say? Uh, weight basis sometimes weight bias, also called bias. fat. Oh, excuse me, weight bias sometimes also called fat phobia or weight stigma, describes the negative attitudes and stereotypes surrounding and attached to larger bodies. This is totally written by- they totally made, They've totally <laughs> made that up. They, yeah, really, they, just, they just shoehorned something into a, a phobia. <laughs> I've, I've, I've actually heard people- in a clinical condition all of a sudden. I've, had, I've heard people say, if you don't want to date someone that's overweight, it's because you're fat phobic. Seriously. It's yeah. like, I don't want to date, you know, I only want to date tall guys. Well, I guess I'm short phobic or something like yeah, that, right? Yeah, you just add phobic to anything. Yeah. First off, uh, excess body fat is a very visual, and this may be one of the challenges of, of being uh, overweight, is that it's a very visual representation of your health not being ideal. So naturally, we're going to have, um, we're not going to feel as attracted, okay, to people in this particular way. Just like someone with really bad skin, someone whose teeth are really bad, or someone who, who looks like they're sick, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the reason There's why. That's the root of it. visible displays of not being healthy. That's, that's the root of it. The, yeah, Now, that's truth. no excuse for treating people like shit. That's no, no excuse for not being um, nice to people, for being an asshole or a jerk. So if somebody's a jerk to you because you're overweight or uses that as an excuse to be a jerk, well, they're, they're an asshole. But fat phobia, they invented that. They created it. It doesn't even exist. I don't even think that existed before they started making it up. Is I mean, maybe it did in a very small percentage, but- I, have you guys ever met someone that's really no no fat phobic no, that you no. would say oh my god you have this irrational fear? <laughs> no, I mean claustrophobia. Like I know a couple of people that have that for real and like have just been in somewhat tight space situations and, and like had panic attack like serious serious yeah you know like it's it's a condition a serious condition so this is completely it's made up. if you were really fat phobic you wouldn't be able to go anywhere because there's yeah. fat people you'd everywhere. Be like, ah! <laughs> you'd like run. You wouldn't be able to go to Disneyland. You wouldn't be able to go to the movies. No. You would not be able to go down to Walmart. Oh my you would not be able to go anywhere. You wouldn't live in an ice cream shop. You wouldn't be able to go like, anywhere no. if you were truly fat phobic. If you were scared, like you're scared of spiders and scared of those things like that, that that's irrational. You would freak out every time you got into yeah. any of the places. There's no, there's nowhere where you see everybody super fit. Even in the gym is full of that. So. Oh my God. In the gym, you're going to see quite a few people that are overweight because yeah. they're trying to improve their health. Stupid. So the reason why this is, again, so such a terrible uh, message is it's telling people themselves who are trying to improve their health that they're somehow fat phobic or they somehow fall into this category of these terrible people that are against larger bodies or whatever, which is very, very strange in a twisted way it's, of manipulating it's people. It's a weird way to, to provide somebody a word to shut down any kind of like conversation you might be having with somebody, yep. like some kind of like disagreement. I've noticed that a lot. It, it, and we're in this sort of world now where like you get into comment sections and you know back and forth with people and like it's even harder to have honest conversations because you know terms all of a sudden will get thrown out if they don't like you know what you have to say and then it just shuts down the conversation it's just a way to justify your behavior it's a it is a scientific fact you are eating more than you are moving and you want to justify that that's simple mm -hmm. it is literally that simple it is a justification for your behaviors your behaviors have led to 30, 40, 50, And the doctor miles. that wants to tell you to lose weight because he sees your blood lipids and he wants you to lose weight for your health, well, he's just fat phobic. 
Yeah. I actually saw saw that by the way. I've seen people say, "See how easy that is to use?" and just sh shuts it down. Shuts it down. Oh, my doctor told me to lose weight. Says I'm 100 pounds overweight. They're fat phobic. I'm gonna find another doctor. I actually saw wow. a whole thing on that, and there was actually people supporting them, which is crazy. It's like, um, well, that's what a doctor's supposed to do is tell you how to improve or, or decrease. It, it, I should by say, the way, you can. Dying. You can. I, I know what I just said. I know I guarantee is gonna irritate some people, but you can be that way, and I can still be empathetic to that person. I mean. 90 you just be a good person. Ninety percent of the conversation that we have on this, uh, you this podcast, you're trying to help them, are is around behaviors and helping people and admitting to our own behaviors that we struggle with and how to overcome that and work on that and improve that. And it's a lifelong journey and pursuit. So I have tremendous empathy for somebody who struggles with those things, but to uh, to deny it or and, and ignore it and to then potentially blame it on other people is not going to help you it is not going to make it's going to hurt you it's not going to make your life any in, any more rich by doing that or healthy and, by acting that and way. it actually demonizes this is the part that really hurts my feelings <laughs> to be quite honest is it demonizes the very people who make a career out of helping right. people in this situation by the way we don't help it people renders us powerless uh, yeah i, I want to be like straight up like we don't help people by walking up to random people who are obese and saying, I'm here to help you. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> I, I know that. I know that. I'm not going to do that. It's got to make a any trainer sense. who's tried that though. Right. Well, I, somebody. <laughs> that's so stupid. It's not going to work. Here's my card. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to work. What? Like, I, I help people who came and seek help, right? Yeah. But, but they did seek help, and I was very empathetic, and I understand the struggle, and it's challenging. I had my own body image issues just in the opposite direction. So I totally get it. But fat phobia is made up, doesn't exist. It's a it's it's another way to manipulate you into uh, buying products or going in a particular political direction. Here's the next one. This one's I've talked about this one many times, but that's the myth that gyms are these judgmental, unaccepting places. So like you're gonna walk into this gym, you're overweight, and everybody in there is gonna look at you and be like, "What are you doing here? Yeah. You don't belong in here. Get out of here. Don't touch my equipment. Wow, look at that woman. She's so fat. Look at that guy. He doesn't look good or whatever." This is terrible because there's actually zero, there's not even a kernel of truth in this. Yeah. Gyms are the most accepting places in the world for people who are struggling with, with weight. The most it, accepting. I mean, this is a perfect example of like judging a book by its cover or like, you know, coming in with narratives you created in your own mind. Uh, Who's and, being and judgmental? Expecting, yeah, and expecting that is to be the result. And, you know, I, and I noticed like, I mean, anybody's guilty of this. Like I'm guilty of this, of, you know, just creating and portraying thoughts in other people that I think they're yeah. thinking of me. Uh, and, and this is just sort of adding gasoline to that. And it's, it's justifying, you know, this sort of idea, uh, this insecurity you have that's coming in when in fact, it's not actually reality. Like being in that environment is a very embracing environment where people actually care about improving and want you to be a part of it. Remember when they did that reality show? I remember, yes. I remember being so irritated. Like, that would never even happen yes. right there. They did this reality show. Do you remember this, Justin? It was like a hidden Which camera. One? Yeah, it was like a hidden camera, and they staged like two people. It was like, like these two girls. And they were intentionally like gossiping about somebody else. Like, it was like somebody who was overweight. And like, this was oh, in a gym. God. It was in a gym. And what they were seeing was who would say something with someone like. And so, uh. and I remember hating it because I remember going, like, you're already representing. The gym, like th that's like a normal thing to happen. Yes. So with the, with the, the real, the, the the study or the what they were trying to see was like, if these two people were gossiping about this other overweight person that was trying to work out, would somebody chime in and say something or do something? And you know what's funny? It happened so fast. People jumped in. It was like literally whoever was next to them oh, would walk great. up to them and tell them off. Yeah. It was like, and that's what one of the, that's what, what the host said. Yeah, but wow. and, and but still though, I I didn't even like it because that never would happen. I, I, I've been in gyms for it's an artificially twenty years, produced situation. Okay, yeah. and so I would think statistically speaking, I would probably have a really good chance of seeing that at least a handful of times, if it even happens at a small you know fraction of the. I've never seen two girls gossiping loud enough to where I could hear them about somebody who's overweight trying to work out. Never. Oh my God. I'll tell you something that. right now. If you yeah. want to get, if you want to, you want to have uh, threats of violence, here's something that you could go into a gym and make fun of another person trying to improve themselves. And you wait and see how the other members, especially the seasoned, consistent members, yeah. how fast they get on you and kick you out of that gym. So do you guys think that, okay, I'm going to ask an unpopular potential or question or uh, that may lead to an unpopular answer. I should say, um, we early on we came out and and really hammered shreds. If you've been with us long enough, 
Uh, and you know, Justin used to make fun of Joey Swole all the time. He's, he he's has recently revived his his you know stardom or fandom or whatever you want to call oh, it. Oh, is he's like the defender of yes people in the gym. So, do you think? Do, I want to hear your opinions on this. Do you think it is a good or a bad thing what he is doing? Oh, do you see I what he does. Wa- I haven't watched I, enough he, of him. Yeah, describe it to me. Hold up, because- I guarantee. I guarantee one of his last video. You know what videos- he does? He's like like somebody who he made a shames video- the shamer. Yeah. So is that so? So what? My, I'm asking you guys because I'm I'm wondering if because it's obviously in right in this wheelhouse of gyms or judgmental. What, what he does is he finds somebody. So else. here's where it's part of, partly damaging, partly because he's pushing the narrative that gyms are yes, unaccepting. Right. Um, you know that they're these judgmental, terrible places. If you're out of shape and you're a beginner and you don't know what you're doing. It partially good because he's also, you know, saying, hey, this is unacceptable. But it does push that narrative, doesn't it? I mean, the other the other uh, people that push this narrative that are in our space, which okay. may, makes me mad, is Planet Fitness. Planet Fitness's entire marketing was around gyms that didn't have bodybuilders and judgmental people. And we have an alarm in the gym that goes off. And, you know, if there's a, it's a lunk alarm, in fact, they call it. And I hated that because it painted... Uh, gyms in the wrong way. And it now it was, it was brilliant marketing. It got a lot of people sign up, but it promoted this idea and this myth. And again, it's a fact like, in fact, the most accepting gyms are the most hardcore gyms. This is, this is something a lot of people don't, don't know. If you've never worked out and, or you don't have a lot of experience in gyms, the most intimidating gyms are the hardcore ones. I mean, you walk in, people are serious. Everybody looks super focused the equipment, like there's chalk on the floor, maybe, maybe there's angry music in the background or maybe not. Maybe it's just quiet. Some of these places are quiet. People listen to all music. People are grunting and sweating and it's intimidating. Okay. Here's the, the irony. That's the most accepting gym because everybody in the air is super seasoned, super hardcore. And if you walk in there and you're a beginner, go up to anybody in there and be like, Hey, can someone help me use this machine? Or I want to lose weight. What should I do? And you'll get a bunch of free, really good advice. That won't that that's less likely to happen in those big globo gyms. It's just true, which is the irony, right? People think the hardcore ones are the most judgmental. They're the least. Well, I mean, and it's just it's purely a a numbers game too, though, right? You're if you're a Planet Fitness and you're nine dollars a month, you're getting two thousand workouts a day, probably plus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're in one of those, you know, hardcore gyms, you've got you know fifty workouts in the day, and those fifty people are yeah. probably hardcore serious people who appreciate somebody trying and so it would probably be very much more community driven very and something like that community, yeah. where i mean it's a it's like a cash cow in one of those places so and that's unfortunate because what a lot of gyms don't realize is uh you know one asshole but who is probably even a new person themselves being rude to another person like that now that now that gym has this stigma of like oh these people are fat phobic yeah. or these people are judgmental and- but it's funny right because we've all managed gyms um who were the members that were the coolest, nicest, friendliest? The ones that have been there forever. New mem- yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. The, the most ones. consistent people. Yeah. But this is a terrible myth because it, it keeps people from walking into gyms because they're like, oh, yeah, gyms, those places. Like, people are going to make fun of me. People are going to look at yeah. me. People, are gonna, I mean, people in my own family felt like this. I had to convince my mom to go to a gym recently over stuff like this. And that's my mom. I've been in this space for forever. Um, and now she realizes, oh, my God, gyms are, are not what I thought they were. So uh, terrible myth. Not true whatsoever. And I think, again, they're trying to keep people easily manipulatable. Here's another one. And this one I actually have, there's, there was actually some legislative action that went behind this myth. So it's the myth that building muscle makes men jerks or toxic. There was legislation around this? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yes, there was. So I don't know, I don't know if you guys remember this, but hmm. California prisons, first of all, prisons historically had weight pits oh, or that gyms. was That was the reason why they got it out was that? They... Took them out because they said it may. They didn't want the prisoners to be big, strong, and aggressive. That's how they sold it. Oh, I thought like dudes were really getting their heads bashed in with dumbbells. And well, it, but you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, so I, thought, I thought what was happening. Okay, like, so you know, it's fun. Basically, we have these heavy weapons. We should probably. Get you know them. what? That that can happen. However, when you talk to people that work in those in that industry, um, one of the and we'll get into this, but one of the the, the benefits of having a, like a weight pit is you could take it away. Like when you're in prison, you got nothing. Yeah, right. That's you know, like, but but when you're allowed to work out yeah. and you're there for ten years, like you don't want to. 
yeah. break the rules in there. You want to keep working out in your gym. That's the thing you look look forward to. That's an interesting thought to me because if you're taking away a way for them to have any kind of like self improvement and independence, it's like taking away it, the library. Yeah, how much more animosity are you going to get in return for that? It'd more be, depression. It'd be more. interesting to actually see if after they got it pulled. If there was anybody who actually went back to do some, yeah, was there a reduction in violence? Yeah, I don't think so. I I bet you not. I bet you not. That would be a really you know Arnold. You know Arnold. They did this in Pumping Iron. Arnold used to travel to gyms and do free seminars and stuff, like uh, like self improvement tools, like um, education, exercise, like that kind of stuff, Um, spiritual practices. Those should be encouraged in prisons. So I, it was to me when they took them out, it was such a big deal to me because I'm like, that's the dumbest. Why would you do that? Like, mm-hmm. what, they, they need an outlet and they need to feel empowered in some way. And I yeah. met a lot of, by the way, I've employed a lot of ex felons who found their way through fitness. They started working it's out. Such a good point that, it's such a good point that Justin makes. So it's like, you would think that actually the more things that the, the inmates gravitate towards that you potentially could restrict them from if they're not behaving yeah. correctly would be, I would think would be more of an asset to you keeping the place. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, like a basketball court. Right. I know they do that with battle. Like no, you know, no more basketball today. Cause right. you guys were, you know, acting like idiots last time. And so it's like, that gets everybody in line. You keep taking away the things that they have as outlets. And then I would think well, that, so that here's, would be just harder to yeah, manage. What else are you going to take away? Yeah. And I, th- and honestly, I think it was because it made inmates easier to control because they're more depressed, more sick, more whatever. And not as big and not as strong and not as intimidating. And and mm. a lot of some of these see, look, I'm not shit. What if they really knew that? Maybe that was their intention was that they're easier to be controlled because they're sick, they're weak and depressed versus if they feel yeah. independent, strong now, and empowered. Now, now, aside from that, because that's kind of like a like a side, you know, conversation. Generally speaking, the process of building muscle, which requires discipline, patience, acceptance, failure, because if this doesn't work, that doesn't work, like it doesn't make men toxic. It makes men better. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, can you have Healthier. a can you have a toxic jerk who's big and muscular? Of course you can. Mm-hmm. Of course you can. But uh, but that's that that's the exception, not the rule. The, the 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 toxicity, the anger issues, the stuff like that tends to improve in people who pursue pursuits of self uh, growth, right? Of personal growth. And fitness and building muscle is just well, a part of that. Let's talk about mental health. Like, what what does that look like for somebody that that isn't pursuing anything like weight training to help you know them get stronger and healthier and be in a better mindset? Uh, you know, in general, like, uh, I mean, I hate to bring up like shooters, but like, li- I would wonder about that in terms of toxic um, masculinity, like on somebody that's weaker and, and feels a little bit more victimized, that, and then they want to do something about it versus is somebody that's strong, you know, and able body. That's, that's 100%. Yeah. You know, I've heard it said before, if you think strong men are dangerous, just I'm more yeah, concerned of, about weak men. Weak men, right? So, no, no, no. Uh, building muscle doesn't make men toxic jerks. It, it doesn't make women toxic jerks. It improves people, but they still exist. To- the toxic, shitty people exist at all, all sides of the spectrum. All right, next. This one's funny. And I read an article on this the other day, and there's actually you know, I have several articles now I've read on this which is that fitness and gyms lead to, of all things, alt-right political leanings, which is really crazy. <laughs> now, the, the truth is just happens. The truth is it's a, a reverse correlation, right? So it's they, what they have found is they've done research on people that work out and they tend to lean to the right or towards a, a, a libertarian, right? That's right, what, right. And what, so what they found- so Not more, alt-right. More moderate. That got, that got yeah, moved like into alt-right. Middle you know of the I mean? spectrum. But I mean, that's where that-, that I think that where that uh, the the data comes from. Studies have found that that as men become physically stronger, they're more likely to lean conservative. Um, and there's some theories as to why. Uh, by the way, there's an unhealthy and unhealthy conservatism. So just like there's a healthy and unhealthy liberalism. So don't twist them. Like when you think conservative, don't think just the toxic, like the shitty sides or whatever. There's there's healthy versions of it. But really what it is, is at, at its core, uh, especially when you talk about like libertarianism, which is like, you know, kind of original, that, that, that original, in fact, it was called classical liberalism. Now it's referred to as uh, more conservative. But when you look at, um, uh, you know, people, as people become more empowered, they're less likely to want uh, government to do things for them or to control things for them. And so this is just part of that process. As you do things to improve your health as you do things and you feel more in control of things. So to that you're point, less likely to want 
you know, people impeding on what you're doing or whatever. So that's what they find. So th and so that's why this got pushed in that direction. Let me ask you that. So if that's true, does that mean that um, uh, entrepreneurs compared to W-2 employees are, are, are entrepreneurs at a higher rate, uh, yeah. right? Yep. Is that true? Yeah, more more likely because that, be that would make sense because you're you're obviously if you are controlling your paycheck and deciding yep. your work hours, you're a more empowered person. You've decided to go down that path, and the opposite is true if you work for corporate America and you have to show up when someone tells you you yep. have a boss who oversees you. You're less empowered. It's just a fact. So are are people who are entrepreneurs more right leaning at a higher rate to compare? Yeah, to Yeah, and remember the right left America? spectrum is like really twisted now. But yes, generally, but it depends on the space. There's huge. I didn't know that swings depending on the space. Like higher education tends to be over here, and blue collar tends to be over there. But nonetheless, um, all fitness does is it makes people feel more empowered, and so they're less likely to feel like they need to vote for politicians who are going to promise them things or protect them from things or take things away in order to keep them safe, that kind of stuff. But there is no, it's not about alt-right. In fact, alt-right, which is very unhealthy and toxic, if people pursue improving themselves, they're probably less likely to be in that, in that kind of toxic space. All right, here's the next one. Um, this one's funny to me, which is, and I've heard people tell me this, which is that gyms are only for, for privileged people. Right, because oh, you can well, you can go to the gym. Uh, Planet Fitness took care yeah, of that. I was going to say, there's that as an option. <laughs> so, you, I mean, you drink one Starbucks coffee a month, and you're almost at the same price as what Planet. That's Fitness. why it makes me laugh. Is because gyms, <laughs> man, access to a gym is so cheap. I, yeah, let me tell you something. Low, there isn't a street. No, I, I guarantee you both have stories like this. I I remember at every gym that I managed. Okay, uh, I had several members that were homeless. Mm -hmm. That would pay for yeah. a gym membership, yep. so they could use a shower. So they could use a stuff. shower, the soap, and all the things like that because they could they saved money by having a gym membership to yep. be able to to be able to shower and wash their body yeah. through the gym. I signed up several. Yes, I, I did. Lived in RVs and would come in would come in and and use use our our facility. Or, and that's not even Planet Fitness. Uh, or I mean, uh, yeah, Planet Fitness, which is nine dollars. I'm talking. This was yeah 20, when we were doing thirty bucks a month. Yeah, twenty thirty bucks a month. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, I, this is such a now. Now, now, here's part of that. Yeah, okay, fine. Silly. At some point, I guess it might be an expense you can't afford, which I totally get, even at nine dollars a month. Okay, fitness is not uh, exclusive to gyms. Uh, there's there's, you, there's lots of things you can do to improve your health and fitness through activity that requires zero equipment. They require nothing at all, just your body. We have whole programs designed around no equipment. So this idea again is designed to divide people. Into making people think, um, well, you know, gyms are just for those people over there that are privileged, and they're not for you, which is not true. And and by the way, I, I want to say one thing too. I've never been in an environment as accepting of different political leanings, different ways of living, different ways of you know who you like to yeah, you know hook up with. Overall diversity in general. Gyms are are incredible. Very like diverse. That. It's funny. I was talking to so Father Steve is a priest. He's a friend of mine. And he told me one of the things he loves the most about the gym is he goes, man, when, I'm, when we're in the gym and we're all squatting or deadlifting or pressing and everybody's like motivating each other, he goes, nobody gives a shit who you voted for. Nobody cares, you know, you know who you like to sleep with. Nobody cares. All the, we're all there like trying to improve ourselves through this thing called fitness. So it's super, it's it's interesting to me that, they, that they're trying to label I, this it. This one's really experience. interesting to me too, because I guarantee you where, no matter where you live in the country, Okay. So long as there is a gym there, right? Obviously, there's some places that don't have gyms for you know an hour, or two hours away, or whatever. But if you have a a you know local gym in the area, and you get an opportunity to meet the manager or the owner of that facility, and nine dollars a month is what's keeping you from getting access there, and you come to him and say, "Listen, I I just I don't have access to the money. I don't have, but I want to work out so bad. What is there anything I could do around here? Oh God, to get a free membership? I'll, I'll sweep your floors. I'll take out your trash. I did I'll, that. I guarantee. I did too. Yep. When I had people that I I could tell were in a position that they couldn't, and so I and I know most gym owners are like this a gym owner is not going to be made or made or uh rich or broken or broken from nine dollars more or less a month and seeing somebody who who genuinely cannot afford uh access there and is willing to work or do something to help out to j just to get free access they have the power to write a free pass and they'll do it every single month if that person is 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 being honest and is trying to help out i gave guaranteed i gave a free pass to someone like that and then they were so great for the culture of the gym because they were so positive and so motivated and just such great people 
I just kept hooking hooking them up. That's real gym culture. That's real gym culture. Yeah. That's the truth, by the way. And I ran the, some of the most successful money making gyms in one of the largest fitness organizations. That and that was it. And by the way, successful gym owners understand culture, and the culture is so opposite of some of the stuff that we're talking about. Oh yeah, way opposite. Here's another one: um, eating healthy is uh, much more expensive than eating unhealthy, or eating healthy is privileged. This is terrible. This is a terrible. This is a terrible myth because. Eating healthy is actual. Well, there's ways to do it that are actually easy and will save you money. They'll save you money over processed fast food garbage, 100%. For example, we've done whole episodes on this. In fact, um, you know, maybe we can link one of them, but uh, rice. Rice is extremely inexpensive, great source of complex carbohydrates, easy to digest. There's one. Dry beans, another great source of complex carbohydrates, also source of fiber, also source of some plant protein. Very inexpensive, long shelf life, easy to prepare. Uh, tuna, tuna fish. You could buy. By the way, you can buy, buy all. You could buy this at Seven Eleven. Tuna mm -hmm. fish, milk, eggs, um, frozen. You know, bulk chicken, frozen bulk ground beef, frozen vegetables, frozen vegetables. Okay, yep. all extremely inexpensive. And you can find them almost anywhere. In fact, you can find a lot of them at convenience stores, not even at grocery stores. So this whole idea that eating healthy is more expensive is is, is totally yeah, false. It doesn't have to be all organic and, and That's where farm it comes raised from. Yeah. and yeah. all these buzz terms out there. You know, and which you know, the further along in your journey, and you can afford some of those things and to get you know up your quality, like sure. But uh, in terms of like the big movers what you just mentioned is very accessible and you know, you can buy it in bulk and, and it's pretty cheap. This is another politicized thing to me. I mean, I, I never even heard of this until whole foods came around, you know, once whole foods became one of the more popular stores and everybody, and everyone calls it whole paycheck because how expensive it is and stuff like that. Now all of a sudden it's like, yeah, it'll, oh. it'll be more expensive. If you shop there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and so now it's yeah. turned into only privileged people can eat the, the healthiest grocery stores. It's just like, you don't need the healthiest grocery store to be healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you gave really good examples of some options that are, are ridiculously cheap, especially if you buy in bulk. Mm -hmm. You buy five pound bags of rice, yep. five pound bags of beans, like you, those things you you would save a ton of money. But the truth is, if you're overweight because you are in a quote unquote food desert, you just need to eat less. Uh, and your, your health will dramatically yeah, improve. Yeah, and your health Already will your dramatically health improve. Yeah. By the way, we do at exercises at home and eat less, and you will dramatically change your health. Yeah, and by the way, we looked up uh, the definition, because I had never heard of that before, food desert. Food desert, yeah. And then I, someone brought it up, and I'm like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's when people don't have access to healthy food. So I'm imagining like a like We're a hearing city. this a lot lately, so. Yeah. I, right, so I'm like, what is this, and is this another like political term that's been used to you know to sell things and kind of prop, you know propaganda? I looked it up. Do you know what a food desert is? What they uh, what's considered a food desert? Hmm. This is a place, and they label it as usually an urban. I'm gonna read it right now. Low income urban areas, which by the way, th that's interesting. They include that, but that's fine. Yeah. You'll see why. Low income urban areas where a significant number of people lives farther than ready for this a mile away <laughs> from the nearest grocery store. Do any of you guys live <laughs> close, uh, less than a mile away from a grocery store? Yeah. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The closest grocery store to me is two miles away. Yeah. So that's crazy that they would make that the the definition. So and notice can, how they include low-income so urban areas. so they can make areas. it sound like it's a much bigger problem than what it really is. Right, yeah. You were talking about a very small minority of people. And by the way, I lived in like a true, what I would consider food. I grew up. Okay, and well, and, far like when you were on the yeah, it was yeah. an hour and a half to the first. That's a real store. one. Yeah, right. and we had a gas station is where we had to get our 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 food from, or once once every other week we would drive into town, stock way up, put everything in a freezer, and that's how we'd eat. So like, I get what it's like to be in a, like a, what I would consider a real food desert where you have to drive that. But far. that's why it's interesting. Notice how they put urban areas. Yeah. Urban are yeah. dense. Yeah. And they include that less than a mile away. The truth is a real food desert, like you're like an hour away from food. Those places exist, but a majority of people live, you know, within five miles of a grocery store. But even convenience stores offer healthy options, healthier options. I mean, to me, it's yeah. just another th way to feed in, Viable options, feed into say. the op op oppression Olympics that we play all the time. It's just like, another, oh, here's one more thing that we can, we can marginalize and show all oh, these people yeah. over here. It's just like, and again, you can have empathy for that, but then also 
call bullshit on the victimhood shit. Yeah. Like, get out of that. Like, the, it's not serving you to have that attitude of poor me. I'm in this situation. Poor, because you know what? If you have that attitude, you're going to be in that situation forever. I 100 mm -hmm. agree. But it's but again, this is one of those things where it's there's actually no truth in it. Eating healthy, which which this is what eating healthy includes. Okay, eating less. Okay, so you're eating less. It includes foods with less ingredients and less required processing, typically, both of which cost money. In other words, if I eat more, I will necessarily spend more money. If I eat foods that require more processes to put together, I will necessarily spend more money in, when I'm comparing in the proper context. So like rice that's dry, one ingredient, it's got a long shelf life because it's dry in a bag. Okay, so it's cheaper than rice chips or processed foods that contain rice, for example. Okay, dried corn, which dried corn also has long shelf life, is going to be cheaper than corn-based processed foods when you go on a, on a calorie per calorie type of basis. So my point with this one is it's, it's not just off, it's completely the opposite. And so what it does, and this is why it's so damaging, is people who are in situations where they do feel they live in poverty where they do feel, man, things are tough. They're going to hear this and they're going to be like, "I have, there's nothing I can do. Yeah. I have no options. I have no choices. I have, I'm not empowered I'm in any particular in way. Situation. I'm helpless. And then what does that tend to breed? And it, again, it, people don't even take that first step, which is infuriating. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam, and you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.